In this chapter, we will discuss data languages in a relational database environment, which is undoubtedly the most popular in use nowadays. Let's start with the overview. We will start by giving a brief introduction to relational database systems. This will be followed by an overview of the SQL data definition language. Note that SQL is one of the most popular database languages used in the industry. We will also discuss how SQL can be used for data manipulation, such as retrieving data, updating data, inserting new data, and deleting existing data. We will then zoom into SQL views and SQL indexes, which are part of the external and physical database model respectively. We will illustrate how SQL can be used for authorization by granting or revoking privileges to users or user accounts. The chapter will be concluded by reviewing various ways to include SQL statements into general purpose programming languages, such as Java, so as to develop full-fledged database applications. As the term suggests, relational databases are based upon the relational data model and managed by a relational database management system, or RDBMS. SQL, or Structured Query Language, is the language which is used for both data definition and data manipulation. As already mentioned, it is one of the most popular database languages in use in the industry nowadays. Note that SQL is sometimes also pronounced as SQL. It is both set-oriented and declarative. In other words, as opposed to record-oriented database languages, SQL can retrieve many records at a time. Furthermore, you only need to specify which data to retrieve, in contrast to procedural database languages, which also require to explicitly specify the navigational access path to the data. Various SQL versions and extensions have been introduced, with the first one already in 1986 and the most recent one in 2011. Note that each relational database vendor provides its own implementation of SQL, whereby typically the bulk of the standard is implemented, complemented with some vendor-specific add-ons. SQL can be used both interactively and embedded. Let's illustrate this. Here you can see an example of using SQL interactively in a MySQL environment. MySQL is an open source RDBMS which can be freely downloaded from the web. It is very popular in the industry. In this screenshot, you can see that a query has been entered in the query window. We will explain later how this query works, but it basically selects all product numbers, product names of products for which more than one order line is outstanding. The query can then be executed and the result displayed in the result window. Other RDBMSs such as Microsoft Access, Oracle, IBM DB2 also provide facilities to execute queries in an interactive way. Here you can see the same query but now embedded in a host language, which is Java. Obviously, this is an example of embedded SQL. To work with embedded SQL, the host language needs to have various constructs or procedures to connect with the database, execute the query, and process its results. We will discuss how to do this later in the chapter. As already mentioned, SQL is the language of choice in a relational database environment. It can be used for both data definition as well as data manipulation. As a data definition language, or DDL, SQL has a create table statement for defining the logical scheme, 
create database, create table space and create index statements for the physical scheme and a create view statement for the external scheme. When used as data manipulation language or DML, SQL allows to retrieve data using a select statement, add data using an insert statement, modify data using an update statement, and remove data using a delete statement. Furthermore, SQL also foresees language constructs for security and transaction control, as we will discuss later. In most RDBMS environments, SQL is implemented as a, fee as a free form language. In other words, no special indentation is required, as was the case for legacy programming languages such as COBOL. Most SQL implementations are case insensitive. It is, however, recommended to adopt a consistent formatting style to facilitate the understanding and maintenance of your SQL queries. As already mentioned, several commercial implementations of SQL exist, each providing their own dialect of the standard. The SQL, DDL and DML statements are clearly separated in order to successfully implement the tree-level database architecture. Here you can see the tree-level architecture illustrated again. Let's discuss it bottom-up. At the physical database level, we find the SQL database, SQL table space, and SQL index definitions. At the logical database level, we have the SQL table definitions, whereby a table corresponds to a relation from the relational model. At the external database level, SQL views will be defined, which essentially offer a tailored set of data for one or more applications or queries. The latter can be implemented in a host language or in an interactive environment. Remember, these levels should be connected but loosely coupled such that a change in one level has minimal to no impact on all other levels above. Let's start by discussing SQL as a data definition language. A key concept to start off with is the SQL scheme. This is a grouping of tables and other database objects such as views, constraint and indexes which logically belong together. An SQL scheme is defined by a scheme name and includes an authorization identifier to indicate the user or account of users who own the scheme. They can perform any action they want within the context of the scheme. A scheme is typically defined for a particular business process or context, such as a purchase order or HR system. Here you can see the SQL definition of a scheme called purchase, whereby B. Bossens is assigned as the owner. Once we have defined a scheme, we can start creating SQL tables. An SQL table implements a relation from the relational model. It typically has multiple column, it typically has multiple columns, one per attribute type, and multiple rows, one for each tuple. An SQL table can be created using the create table statement followed by the name of the table. Here you can see two examples. The first one creates a table product which will be assigned to the default scheme. The second example creates a table product within the purchase scheme. Note that it is recommended to explicitly assign a new table to an already existing scheme to avoid any confusion or inconsistencies. An SQL table will have various columns, one per attribute type. As an example, our SQL table product can have columns such as product number, product name, product type, etc. Each of these columns will have a corresponding data type to represent the format and range of possible values. 
Here you can see some examples of commonly used SQL data types. Char n represents a fixed length string with size n. Var char n represents a variable length string with maximum size n. Small int represents a small integer, so with no decimal, between minus 32,768 to 32,767. Int represents an integer between the specified limits. Float nd represents a small number with a floating decimal point. The total maximum number of digits is n with a maximum of d digits to the right of the decimal point. Double nd represents a large number with a floating decimal point. The total maximum number of digits is n, with a maximum of d digits to the right of the decimal point. Date represents a date in format year, month, day. Date time represents date and time in the format specified. Time represents time in format hours, minutes, seconds. Boolean represents true or false. Blob represents a binary large object, such as an image, audio, or video. Note, however, that these data types might be implemented differently in various RDBMSs, and it's recommended to check the user manual for the options available. It is also possible to define a user-defined data type or domain in SQL. This can be handy when a domain can be reused multiple, ta multiple times in a table or scheme. Changes to the domain definition then only need to be done once, which greatly improves the maintainability of your database scheme. Here you can see an example of a domain prod type domain. It is defined as a variable number of characters of which the value is either white, red, rosé or sparkling. If you would later, if you would decide later to also include beer, then this can be easily added to the list of admissible values. Note, however, that some RDBMSs, such as MySQL, do not support the concept of an SQL domain. SQL column definitions can be further refined by imposing column constraints. The primary key constraint defines the primary key of the table. Remember, a primary key should have unique values and null values are just not allowed. A foreign key constraint defines a foreign key of a table, which typically refers to a primary key of another or the same table, hereby restricting the range of possible values. A unique constraint defines an alternative key of a table. A not null constraint prohibits null values for a column. A default constraint can be used to set a default value for a column. Finally, a check constraint can be used to define a constraint on the column values. All these constraints should be set in close collaboration between the database developer and business user. Here you can see an ER model for a purchase order administration which we will use to illustrate both SQL DDL and SQL DML. Let's spend, some, let's spend some time understanding it. We have three entity types, supplier, purchase order and product. A supplier has a unique supplier number, which is its key attribute type. It is also characterized by a supplier name, supplier address, supplier city and supplier status. A purchase order has a unique purchase order number, which is its key attribute type. It also has a purchase order date. A product has a unique product number, which is its key attribute type. It also has a product name, product type and available quantity. Let's now take a look at the relationship types. A supplier can supply minimum zero, maximum n products. Vice versa, a product is supplied by minimum zero, maximum m suppliers. 
The supplies relationship type has two attribute types, purchase price and the lift period representing the price and period for a particular supplier to supply a particular product. A supplier has minimum zero maximum end purchase orders on order. Vice versa, a purchase order is on order with minimum one, maximum one, or in other words, with exactly one supplier. Purchase order is existent dependent from supplier. A purchase order can have several purchase order lines, each for a particular product. This is the relationship type between purchase order and product. A purchase order can have minimum one, maximum and products as purchase order lines. Vice versa, a product can be included in minimum zero and maximum end purchase orders. The relationship type is characterized by the quantity attribute type, representing the quantity of a particular product in a particular purchase order. Here you can see the corresponding relational tables for our ER model. The supplier and product table correspond to the supplier and product entity types. The supplies table is needed to implement the end-to-end -end relationship type between supplier and product. Its primary key is a combination of two foreign keys, supplier number and product number. It also includes both the purchase price and delivery period, which were the attribute types of the relationship type, remember. The purchase order table corresponds to the purchase order entity type in the ER model. It also has a foreign key supplier number, which refers to the supplier number in the supplier table. The purchase order line table implements the end-to-end -end relationship type between purchase order and product. Its primary key is again a combination of two foreign keys, purchase order number and product number. Also the quantity attribute type is included in this table. Here you can see the corresponding DDL definitions. First, we create a table supplier. The supplier number is defined as HAR4 and set to be the primary key. We could have also defined it using a number data type instead, but let's say the business asked us to define it as four characters so as to also accommodate some older legacy product numbers which may occasionally include alphanumeric symbols. Subname is defined as a not null column. In the, in the product table, the product number column is defined as the primary key. The product name column is defined as not null and unique. Hence, it can be used as an alternative key. The prod type column is defined as a variable number of characters up to 15. Its values should either be white, red, rosé or sparkling. The available quantity column is defined as integer. The supplies table has four columns. First, supplier number and product number are defined. The purchase price is defined as double eight comma two. In other words, it consists of a total of eight digits with two digits after the decimal point. The delivery period column is assigned the time data type. The primary key is then defined as a combination of sub number and prop number. The foreign key relationship is then also specified. Both foreign keys cannot be null since they both make up the primary key of the table. Note that the on update cascade and on delete cascade statements will be discussed later. Here you can see the purchase order table defined with the purchase order number, purchase order date and supplier number columns. The latter is again a foreign key. We conclude our database definition with the purchase order line table. It has three columns, purchase order number, prod number and quantity. Both purchase order number and prod number are foreign keys and make up the primary key of the table.
Since many database objects are connected, we must specify what to do upon modification or removal of a referenced object. As an example, think about a tuple whose primary key value is referenced by means of a foreign key relationship by another tuple. What would have to happen if this tuple's primary key is modified or if the tuple is removed in its entirety? This can be specified by using referential integrity constraints. The onUpdate cascade option says that an update should be cascaded to all referring objects. Similarly, the onDelete cascade option says that the removal should be cascaded to all referring objects. In case the option is set to restrict, the update or removal will be halted in case referring objects exist. Set null implies that all referring objects will be set to null. This obviously assumes that a null value is allowed. Finally, set default allows to set a default value. Here you can see this illustrated. We listed some tuples of the supplier table. Let's focus on supplier number 37, whose name is at fundum. This supplier has four referring supplies tuples and five referring purchase order tuples. Suppose now that we update the supplier number to 40. In case of an on update cascade constraint, this update will be cascaded to all nine referring tuples where the supplier number will thus also be updated to 40. In case of an on update restrict constraint, the update will not be allowed because of the referring tuples. If we now remove supplier number 37, then an on delete cascade option will also remove all nine referring tuples. In case of an on delete restrict constraint, the removal will not be allowed. Again, it is important to specify these referential integrity constraints in close collaboration with the business user. The drop command can be used to drop database objects. It can also be combined with the cascade and restrict options. You can see some examples here. The first, statement drops this, the, per, the first statement drops the purchase scheme. The cascade option indicates that all referring objects such as tables, views, indexes, etc. will also be automatically dropped. If the option would have been restrict, such as in the second example, the removal of the scheme will be refused if there are still referring objects. The same reasoning applies when dropping tables as you can see illustrated. Once we have finalized the data definitions, we can compile them such that they can be stored in a data catalog of the RDBMS. The next step is then to start populating the database. Here, you can see some examples of tuples listed for the various tables we defined earlier. Let's assume we build a relational database for a wine purchase administration, whereby the products represent wines. The author statement can be used to modify table column definitions. Common actions are adding or dropping a column, changing a column definition, or adding or dropping table constraints. Here you can see two examples. The first one adds the prod image column to the product table and defines it as a blob or binary large object. The second example assigns a default value of 10 to the substatus column. We can now conclude the DDL part of SQL and move on with the DML part.